a consumer may make a complaint about a financial service provider for any number of reasons, ranging from financial hardship to the provision of inappropriate financial advice, among many others. The net is cast far and wide when it comes to the different types of disputes that may arise between a consumer and a financial service provider because ASIC defines a complaint as being any expression of dissatisfaction. Credit Ombudsman Service Limited's Raj Venga says if a consumer becomes dissatisfied with the service they receive from a financial services provider, they can lodge a complaint to any member of staff working within the organisation. What you have to have in place as a financial services provider is to have the training so everyone who, every member of your staff who receives a complaint knows to send it to the appropriate person. You cannot complain that it was the wrong person uh, that received it. If an organisation is licensed to provide financial services to retail clients in Australia, whether this is Australian financial services licensees, Australian credit licensees or credit representatives, they must have a dispute resolution system in place. Under the requirements outlined in ASIC's RG165, a financial services provider must have an internal dispute resolution or IDR system in place and membership of one or more ASIC approved external dispute resolution or EDR schemes. If a consumer has a complaint about a financial services provider, they must first give the organisation an opportunity to resolve the dispute in-house through their own IDR system. However, when a dispute fails to be resolved at the IDR level, the consumer has the right to escalate the complaint to an EDR scheme approved by ASIC. An EDR scheme provides consumers with a free and impartial dispute resolution service which offers an alternative to legal proceedings for resolving complaints with their financial services and product providers. There are currently two EDR schemes which operate in the Australian financial services and credit industries, these being the Financial Ombudsman Service or FOS and COSL. Both are subject to the Corporations Act and are approved and regulated by ASIC to determine financial services disputes. FOS's Alison Maynard says RG139 sets out a number of requirements that an EDR must meet. A regulatory Guide 139 sets out criteria by which schemes must be approved. That includes being fair, being independent, being accessible, being efficient and effective. There are three main reporting obligations which ASIC imposes upon EDRs. Firstly, they must report on serious misconduct by a financial services provider and also identify any systemic issues that may arise. Secondly, EDRs must report to ASIC on a quarterly basis and provide them with a range of statistical data. Thirdly, EDRs are required to provide ASIC with an annual report each year, which is also made available to the general public via the EDR schemes website. EDR schemes cannot adopt an ad hoc approach when it comes to their operation and they each have terms of reference which they must abide by. The terms of reference are essentially the rules by which we operate uh, to perform our dispute resolution functions. We also have some operational guidelines which accompany the terms of reference. The monetary limit of disputes and the caps on compensation that an EDR can award for a dispute are also stipulated by ASIC. From 1 January 2012, the monetary value of a claim must be less than 500000 while the compensation cap that applies to awards are $280,000 per claim. RG139 stipulates that EDRs must treat each dispute separately. Therefore, they must not aggregate claims for the purposes of applying the monetary limit and cap if a consumer has multiple complaints against the same financial services provider. While an EDR scheme's determinations for disputes are binding on the financial services provider, they are not binding on the consumer. In the event that the consumer chooses to accept the decision made, the financial services provider can require that a settlement document be signed. But if the consumer chooses not to accept the decision, then they are free to go and take legal or other action that may be available to them. In reality, very few consumers who lose a case at FOLS then go on and take their financial services provider to court. Meanwhile, if a financial services provider does not comply with a decision made by FOLS or COSL, this may constitute serious misconduct, which is reportable to ASIC. The member of the EDR also risks being expelled from the scheme, which could ultimately jeopardise their licence. 
FOS has three key areas of operation for handling disputes with specialist divisions in investments, life insurance and superannuation, general insurance and banking and finance. Maynard says FOS's membership is made up of a mixture of AFS licensees and authorised credit representatives. As FOS's terms of reference are slightly wider than the corporation's law, it can deal with almost any dispute that a consumer has with their financial services provider. Within the investment, life insurance and superannuation area of FOS, Maynard says the most significant subject of complaint is financial advice disputes where a consumer believes they've received inappropriate advice which has led to financial loss. Another large area of complaint for my team is where a life insurer has declined to play um, or there is a dispute about a claim under a life insurance policy, in particular income protection policies. If a consumer has a complaint against a member of FOS, which has failed to be resolved at the IDR level, they can then lodge this dispute with FOS. FOS has a department of dispute officers who assess the complaints to establish if they are within FOS's jurisdiction. If so, the complaint is accepted and referred to a dispute analyst. The dispute analyst will notify the financial services provider of the complaint and give the member 28 days to respond. The first thing we try and do is getting enough information to assess the dispute. We try and negotiate between the financial services provider and the consumer and we also hold conciliation conferences. So we uh, and we are very successful at resolving disputes um, by negotiation and by an agreed settlement. FOS has a specialist conciliation team whose role is to hold the telephone conciliation conferences between the consumer and the financial services provider. Within the investment, life insurance and super area of FOS, Maynard says a majority of disputes are resolved using the conciliation conference method. We then aim to resolve 80% of disputes within six months uh, and we are essentially meeting that target in most areas of FOS, though there, there is some variation of that. However, if a, if a dispute goes further and requires a decision, that will usually take 12, sometimes up to 18 months. If a dispute fails to be resolved by conciliation, it's then referred to a case manager for further investigation. The case manager will then write a recommendation. If either party does not accept that recommendation, then the dispute will be escalated to an ombudsman or an ombudsman sitting with a panel to make a final decision. If an ombudsman sits with a panel, that panel will be made up of the ombudsman, who is highly legally qualified, and an industry representative and a consumer representative. The industry representative will be different depending on the types of disputes we deal with. So for example, if you have a financial planning dispute that's been decided by a panel, then there will be a financial planning industry representative on that panel. COSL's membership, made up of a mix of smaller players in the financial services sector, makes it the second largest EDR in the world behind FOS in the United Kingdom. COSL receives a wide variety of complaints, however, financial hardship where the consumer is unable to make their loan repayments and risks losing their home, is the single largest source of complaints COSL receives. About 30 to 40% of all our complaints deal with financial hardship. We have to be fair to both parties, both the consumer as well as the member, and it's a fine balance. And the best way of addressing the balance is to try to deal with these cases as fast as we can. So these cases are given a first priority in our system. An alleged incorrect default listing on a consumer's credit file is another common complaint COSL sees, as are complaints about the debt collection practices of a financial services provider. If a consumer has a complaint against a member of COSL, which has failed to be resolved at the IDR level, the consumer can lodge the dispute with COSL. Once a complaint has been received, COSL sends a notification to the financial service provider to advise they've received the complaint and are looking into it and request the member not start legal proceedings to recover any debt. Venga says in cases where the member has already done so, COSL asks for them to suspend the proceedings until such time that they've had a chance to review the complaint. Once COSL looks at the complaint, a preliminary assessment as to its merits is made. And very often we find that the member come up with a solution uh, to resolve it 
which they didn't when they had it internally. I don't know if because EDR is, is involved. Um, we certainly don't put pressure on the member that way, although we do encourage them to resolve it. Kossel has a team of case managers who are responsible for resolving disputes, with one third working in a specialist team dedicated solely to financial hardship claims. Currently, the average time frame for resolving a complaint is around four months. However, when they're not able to be resolved at a case manager level, they're forwarded to the ombudsman, this being Venga, for a determination. However, he says this is a rare occurrence. We don't have a lot because I like being able to tell people we resolve things early and effectively and that's what we do. Unlike Foz and Kozel, the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal, or SCT, is an independent statutory authority not subject to ASIC approval. The role of the SCT is to hear disputes involving superannuation, specifically in the areas of regulated super funds, annuities, deferred annuities and retirement savings accounts. The SCT's Jocelyn Furlan says the tribunal is the only statutory dispute resolution body where membership is compulsory for all regulated super funds in Australia. They must be part of our um, dispute resolution arrangements and we are the only one where there are appeals from our determinations on errors of law to the federal court so if we make a mistake an error of law, we can have our determinations appealed to the federal court. Unlike Foz and Kossel, the SCT only has jurisdiction over complaints of regulated Superfund trustees. Furlan says there are three main types of complaints that the SCT can address, with the distribution of death benefits being the most common dispute they receive. In Australia, in superannuation, trustees have a discretion about who to pay death benefits, superannuation death benefits to, and we get quite a lot of disputes between people who want part of the death benefit. Another common dispute the SCT deals with is disability claims such as TPD, income protection, salary continuance, and any other insured disability benefit paid from a super fund. And our other main area of work is in relation to administration complaints, and that's typically where a member has tried to have a transaction with the fund so they've rolled over their money or they've switched their investment option and it hasn't gone according to what they were hoping for. Or they've received a wrong benefit statement or they think their superannuation benefit is the wrong amount. The SCT generally aims to resolve a complaint through conciliation. Under our legislation we have to try and resolve all of our disputes by conciliation. So we're very focused and we've been doing conciliation since we started operation in 1994 and we find that a very effective way of resolving disputes. Upon receiving a dispute that's within the SCT jurisdiction, it's forwarded to a complaints analyst who will investigate the complaint, obtain all the necessary facts and pass this information to a conciliator. The a conciliator will bring the parties together and try and see if we can, it can be resolved. If it's not resolved at conciliation, it then goes to a formal hearing, which involves a panel, typically three people. Um, it could be myself on the deputy chairperson of the tribunal, um, or uh, we have a, a series of a, a group of part-time members. In the 2010-2011 financial year, the SCT received around 2,500 complaints, of which 123 were forwarded to the panel for resolution. We get the papers two weeks before the scheduled time and date of the hearing, and then we will have a discussion and we will decide, usually that day, at that discussion, what the outcome is going to be. It then takes roughly six weeks to write up the whole decision and get it ready and signed.